Well, welcome to the annual um, opioid, opioid settlement community event. E event. Um, I'm Megan Palmer, and I will be the uh, host or the facilitator for today's session. I'm thrilled to be back. Um, I helped run this last year, and it was a huge success. And we're not expecting anything less from this group today. Uh, first of all, how many of you did, and got your breakfast? You enjoy that? It's going to be out there for a little bit longer if you get hungry. And who doesn't like a free breakfast, right? Um, and before we jump into the agenda, just a couple of things. Housekeeping. If you're not familiar with this area, if you go out this door, there are bathrooms on the left, and then there's vending machines if you want something different to eat. We do ask that you turn your cell phones to um, silent during the presentation. We have many speakers, and so if you would do that, take a minute to check. That would be awesome. And I think that was it. I said the bathroom, the vending machine, and the phones. Question. How many of you have been impacted by the opioid crisis with either a family, a friend, or your community? Let's see a show of hands. And I want you to look around. Everybody. Everybody. So everybody here has some experience and some wisdom to share as we go throughout uh, the agenda. And there's going to be opportunity for you to do some table talk. But that's just confirmation about how serious this crisis is. And so with that, we're going to jump into the agenda. In just a minute, I'm going to ask our county manager, Dina DiOrio, to come up and um, give you a welcome and share some opening comments. And then we are thrilled to have three youth who are going to perform a um, spoken word. I don't know if anybody's seen that before, but really looking forward to that. Then I'm going to come back up and go over the process design and results from some feedback sessions that we held throughout the community over the last couple of months. Then I'm going to turn it over to Robert Nesbitt, and he's going to give you a progress report um, on all of the efforts and planning that's gone on this past year with the opio opioid settlement um, plans. Then I'm going to come back up, and I'm going to lead you into a table discussion, and I'm going to give you those instructions when we get to that part. And then, again, we're thrilled to have keynote speaker Nicole Augustine, who will come up and share her expertise, her thoughts, and feelings about what can be done next. And then lastly, we're going to end with Dina DiOrio coming back up um, for the call to action. And so with that, Dina. Good morning, everybody, and thank you again for being here. As Megan indicated, I am uh, County Manager Dina Ardiorio, and I'm really glad to be with you today as we enter a new chapter in the work of tackling the opioid epidemic in Mecklenburg County. I want to acknowledge the Board of County Commissioners, who just last month approved $6 million in funding for the strategies you will learn more about today. And with us, we have uh, Commissioner Susan Rodriguez McDowell representing the Board of County Commissioners. I don't believe we have any other board members here today. Um, but I did want to acknowledge her presence. I also want to acknowledge the many partners in the room who are on the front lines of the work and understand all too well the toll of the opioid crisis in our community. Because today is election day, school is out, and while they could have stayed home, several young members of our community chose to come here. They represent Charlotte Mecklenburg Youth Council, Teen Health Connection, and Breathe Inc. It's heartbreaking to think you're impacted by this, but we know that you are. We appreciate you being here to learn and give insights about the opioid epidemic. Mecklenburg County, like so many communities across the country, has struggled with the opioid crisis. Over the years, we've held community meetings and even large-scale summits at the convention center where hundreds of people gathered to learn and collaborate. During those years, we were galvanized to do the work, but there was also a sense of shock and disbelief over this growing epidemic in our community. With the opioid settlement funding, we have the opportunity to move into a new era of hope and action. We now have the resources to meaningfully help those in our community suffering from opioid addiction or those at risk. Mecklenburg County will receive $73 million over 18 years to do this work, almost a generation of impact. 
For the teens in the room, you will be in your 30s when this funding cycle is finished. The national settlement includes the memorandum of agreement which outlines that we will have a community meeting each year. As part of these meetings, we will share with you the progress and evolution of the work. But more importantly, we will obtain more of the community's input, listen to your experiences, insights, and suggestions, and use what you have shared to influence the next steps. We will honor your participation by keeping you informed as we move forward. Each year, our approach to engagement will build upon previous years to evolve to ensure we offer public participation that is authentic, inclusive, and effective in navigating the opioid crisis. Today, we will share about the progress and investments the county has made, informed by the input we received at last year's community event. Based on last year's event, we clearly heard that prevention and early intervention is a key priority for our community. With that input, we were intentional about making this strategy a top priority and making prevention and early intervention a focus of this year's event. We want to prevent opioid addiction whenever possible and intervene early for young adults and families who are most at risk. We are also investing in other key components to combat the opioid epidemic, including evidence-based treatment, evidence-based addiction treatment, recovery housing support, recovery support services, naloxone, or better known as Narcan distribution, syringe services programs, and employment-related services. For all of these resources, we will meet people where they are to offer the support that they need. Today is an important day for Mecklenburg County, and I am glad to be here with you as we move this work forward together. Now, as Megan indicated, we have a special performance for you. Please welcome our poets from Breathe, Inc. from Julius Chambers High School, Devon Blakey, Vanessa Hunter, and Lee Dorsey. Thank you so much. Zombies. A mythical dead person who has returned to life as a walking corpse. Infecting, infecting everything, everything around, around them. them. We've seen so much media on the fear of the apocalypse. We talk about it like a figment of our imaginations. But it doesn't seem that far away. At, At my, my high, high school, school, I've been offered more drugs than opportunity. I've seen friends feeding over unfamiliar substances. Dead, dead and, and walking. walking. Dragging their feet lower than their eyes hang. We've, We've lost, lost them. Unfamiliar corpses. corpses. Never thought a runny nose was a symptom for a cold body. Never, Never thought, thought I was a medium for speaking to the dead. dead. Never, Never thought, thought I could watch a ghost stand, stand in front of me. me. We've lost them. Best friends. You don't, don't believe weed, weed can harm until, until you see him in the weeds. weeds. Foggy eyed and shaking. Withdrawing money before he could ever reach withdrawals. withdrawals. Not believing you're a psychic until you see it. Until, until it happens to you. To you. It, it does, does not, not have to be this way. way. We, we do, do not, not have to watch as people kill themselves. Opioids, Opioids are killing Charlotte. Charlotte. We, we are among the walking dead, among the rotting flesh, infecting everything they can get their hands on, watching as their skin rots off the bones with needles, pills, and powder. Right now, there are corpses roaming my halls. Breathing but not living. We, we do, do not, not have, have to, to walk, walk through graveyards. graveyards. We can resurrect classrooms, restore life into those around us. Breathe, Breathe new life, life into Mecklenburg County. We can turn back time. Put away our crystal balls. No longer watch those around us change. But, but be, be the, the change, change they, they need. need. Thank you. Thank you. I think I need to take a breath after that. That was amazing. And I also want to recognize um, a little bit, well, Terry Creech, the executive director. Terry, do you mind standing? Um, of Breathe, Inc. And this is an organization. 
This is an organization to create poetic space for Charlotte youth developing opportunities for positive self-expression through youth-focused poetry. And what an awesome mission. So we thank you all for being here today and participating. Okay, here comes my part. I'm going to give you the progress report um, and, and the results of seven community work uh, focus groups that we held over the past couple of months. Um, in preparation for this year's annual community event, we decided to reach out to those with lived experience and those who can provide input into prevention and early intervention of opioid and s substance abuse. But at this time, I want to provide a context into the purpose of these meetings. Please consider these experiences and results as a snapshot of their moment in time. So we wanted to capture where they are, the here and the now. Um, the meetings were all anonymous, and these results are not quantitative and not very qualitative, but more anecdotal brainstorming of where they were coming from at that time. And so also, as you listen to the results, please keep in mind that these are suggestions and feedback to take into consideration as the county moves forward addressing the opioid crisis resource opportunities. We can't tackle everything at once. There are guidelines, rules, and possibly laws that influence decisions as well. So first, I'm going to go over the process design and the results of the small group sessions. Um, so the process objectives were to engage youth, families, and adults with varied experiences throughout the community. We wanted to gather input to improve the community's approach to prevention. We wanted to remain neutral and non-judgmental, seeking to understand human experiences. We wanted to hear from those in active recovery, receiving treatment services supports, or other relevant lived experience. And lastly, we wanted to use the input received to influence this annual engagement event. The process design and results of small group sessions. Um, I'm going to go over the slide first and then give you some more context. We wanted to meet people where they're at, so we met with intact groups and in certain organizations or certain experiences that you'll learn about in a minute. Um, I facilitated the conversations um, using active listening and open-ended questions to try to get not only discussion for the whole group, but for them to discuss and brainstorm together. Um, we already did that one. Um, the report that I'm going to share with you now are the unfiltered findings at this event. And so the sessions represent only a sample of voices and we'll continue to explore input opportunities for other groups and, pros and populations moving forward. So after an icebreaker asking each of the groups how the, the opioid crisis has impacted them and getting their thoughts, um, we had four questions to ask them that you'll see up here on the right side of the screen. I'll give you a second to look at those and then tell you a little bit more about that. What we then did is put each question on a large post-it um, sticky flip chart paper on the walls around the room that we were in. And then we divided the participants into smaller groups and gave them markers for them to go and have the discussion about that question and brainstorm and write bullet points. And then they rotated after several minutes until they answered all four questions. And then we had a debrief, brief debrief afterwards because we wanted to stick to a clean process. Um, one thing I want to note is that we had several youth groups that participated, and many of them did not have any direct lived experience, but most of them were aware of what's going on. Um, they had family, friends that had been impacted. So I, I tweaked some of these questions 
to not be past tense, but like what would you think would be the missed signs or symptoms of substance or opioid use? So I just want to make that clear that we adjusted to still gather the information from the youth. Like I said, we had seven sessions total. And first we started with the wellness court, which are the adults who are involved actively in court, who have been duly diagnosed with behavioral health issues and uh, substance abuse. We had 22 participants. We had two sessions with Queen City Harm Reduction. And if you're not familiar with the Queen City Harm Reduction, um, it's an organization that invests in providing services using a reduction of harm model. Very interesting. And it was great to spend time with, with those folks. We met with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Youth Council with 14 participants. I gotta say this right, Alan, Alan, Alancia. Alianza, thank you. I've been struggling with that. The more you practice it, the more it, it comes out muddled, the same as opioid. Um, and we met with the youth. There were 18 participants. And it was interesting because some of the youth weren't just high school. They might have been older middle school students. And then we had a separate group run for their parents. And there were 12 participants. And um, since I do not speak Spanish, um, one of the, the, um, the employees there who runs groups and leads some of the activities, he met with these uh, parents and conducted the same exercise. Then lastly, we met with the Teen Advisory Board um, with Teen Health Connection with 14 participants with a total of 102 participants throughout seven sessions. So the first question, when we asked about beginning signs and symptoms often overlooked at first or what they think there might, what signs and symptoms might be occurring, these are the most common themes that were provided. Disengagement and apathy and activities that used to be enjoyable or productive, such as change in appearance, changes in behavior, um, disinterest in sports or hobbies or activities that they weren't once were passionate about. Depression and or shift in mood. And then financial mismanagement, lose, losing resources for basic needs such as housing, transportation, unable to pay bills, etc. And again, these were themes that we, we compiled all of the responses and this, these are what really stuck out. The next question were ideas for services that would have helped for prevention and or early prevention intervention. More mentoring or sponsorship programs of appropriate services, including peer support. Um, and it, it was very common for this to also lead to a discussion about reducing stigma, um, which is very interesting. But they, most of the groups felt that there was a need for more mentors, more sponsors, and more peer support throughout the communities. More effective advocacy and awareness of the effects and dangers of inappropriate opioid use. Um, more advocacy with doctors and healthcare professionals regarding the consequences of prescribing opioids, including follow-up with parents, with patients. And that actually came from a couple of the youth groups, which I found interesting. Um, but not that it was, it was also echoed with some of the adult groups. More anonymous support, such as crisis lines with live people to talk to, no phone trees, um, and live online, online chat lines for immediate support. The question asking what was or can be missing from support networks, this is what we heard. Lack of services and resources to improve social determinants of health and well being. More services regarding harm reduction for those continuing or choosing to use. Again, this is, I found very interesting. More attention to intervention and treatment as opposed to apprehension and punitive actions. 
Um, and then also missing, this was echoed in almost every group, were uninvolved family members and friends, unwilling or unable to help. And lastly, one thing that, that was missing in the support um, were lack of resources of, of um, non-English speaking sponsors, mentors, uh, treatment facilities and such. Um, certainly the Latino com uh, community mentioned that, but we have other populations that are represented with different languages, including the deaf community, um, especially for those online chat rooms and also for a crisis hotline. The game changers. This was a difficult question. Um, we asked what would have been a game changer to prevent or intervene in opioid use either before or at the onset of intervention. And this required some really progressive and creative thinking. These were the themes. Having a safe person or place to go to for help that isn't stigmatizing or intimidating. And that goes back to um, more mentors and sponsors to reduce the stigma and more treatment and intervention versus apprehension and punitive actions. Understanding the effects of use physically, emotionally, mentally, and or the consequences of using such as loss of resources, family, friends, physical pain, etc. And I'm going to have to interject um, one gentleman in one of the groups who was very open and honest. Um, he said that he had no idea when he took that first hit how he was going to feel two weeks later. And he said he was done. He said he was hooked. He didn't realize the chronic physical pain that was going to continue. Um, and that had he known more about the effects and the dangers of opioid use, he does not believe he would have ever started. Um, and then lastly, again, more awareness and advocacy and education regarding the dangers associated with opioid use. And lastly, I, I just want to assure you that all of these groups were completely anonymous. We did not take any specific information or data on those who participated. Um, our, our priority was to provide them the emotional and social safety to participate in this activity. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Robert Nesbitt, Chief of Staff of Consolidated Human Services Agency. And if everyone can say that three times really fast, I would be very impressed. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really catchy title. Um, so thank you all for being here today. And I've got to find my, where is this? Oh, OK, that is why it was, that is why the slides were flying by. I'm a facilitator, and so this is my tool. <laughs> thank you. Let me drop this on, go on back to the beginning here. So first of all, thank you everyone again for being here today. Seeing this great turnout really exemplifies our community's dedication to addressing this epidemic. We couldn't do it without you, and so it just really means so much. Breed Inc., thank you so much for the powerful and moving uh, poem that you shared at the beginning. That was um, just so, so vital for this meeting today. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to know many of you through our collaborative work together uh, over the years, but um, as, as Megan said, I'm Robert Nesbitt, uh, work for the county's Consolidated Human Services Agency, and this morning I will provide an update on our progress with the opioid settlements since our last convening in October of 2022. Based on information we learned from our summit last year, as well as input from key stakeholders throughout the community and subject matter experts, we identified specific strategies to address the opioid epidemic in our community. These strategies are drawn from the North Carolina Memorandum of Agreement, which governs the use of these funds. And you may hear me reference that North Carolina Memorandum of Agreement throughout this morning, or the NCMOA. And these strategies include early intervention, evidence-based addiction treatment, syringe services programs, naloxone distribution or Narcan, recovery support services, recovery housing support, employment related services, and collaborative strategic planning. We developed our opioid settlement spending plan based on these strategies and we've committed $10.9 million to support these key priorities. 
This slide shows the timeline of the events that have occurred since last year's Opioid Settlement Summit. In the months after our last engagement, we utilized the community's feedback and developed a draft of the Opioid Settlement Spending Plan. So that happened in last November and December of 2022. In January of this year, the county manager presented initial recommendations to our Board of County Commissioners at their annual budget retreat. By April of this year, we had finalized the structure for the basic implementation of the spending plan. And through the spring and summer, we hit some really big milestones. We received board approval for the opioid settlement spending plan. And of that $10.9 million plan, we dedicated more than $6 million to be available through a community application process for funding. We held a community information session over the summer regarding this process and opened a community application portal on July 15th, which closed one month later. We completed an initial review of applications we received and were established review panels made up of county staff. We then provided recommendations from this review process to the county manager and deputy county manager, Anthony Trotman. On October 17th, 2023, uh, the board approved the county manager's opioid settlement spending plan for FY24 to FY25. And with these funding recommendations, we have begun to start the contracting process with selected agencies. I also want to highlight that we executed contracts with uh, Queen City Harm Reduction and Alliance Health. And I will tell you more about all of these initiatives and programs later in my progress updates. But first, I want to highlight some of the latest data, some that's been published since our last summit. In 2022, the county experienced 1,444 emergency department visits due to drug overdoses. Then that is down from 1,534 in 2021. In addition, during 2022, our county experienced 290 deaths related to drug overdoses. Of those 290 deaths, 228 can be attributed to illicit opioids. These last two data points have both increased from 2021 to 2022 and are a serious reflection of just how far we have to go in addressing this epidemic. However, I am hopeful with this funding and the investments we are making that in the long term we will be able to turn the tide. Regarding our efforts during the last year, I want to highlight that we've executed a $4 million contract with Alliance Health to increase opioid treatment related services across their provider network. We invested $1.5 million to expand early intervention services through contracts with Anuvia and Center for Prevention Services. We committed another $1.5 million to enhance evidence based addiction treatment to ensure all of Alliance's medication-assisted treatment programs, commonly referred to as MAT or MAT programs, can accept uninsured and underinsured patients. And we're investing $1 million to expand recovery support services throughout the community in Alliance's uh, behavioral health network. I also want to highlight that we have implemented a contract with Queen City Harm Reduction to expand their syringe services program which increases harm reduction supplies and connects clients to prevention, treatment, and recovery support services. This partnership includes a funding match of $210,000 from Vital Strategies, which really helps to enhance the impact and reach of these county dollars. The county has also dedicated $330,000 to support the distribute of naloxone in our community, more commonly known under the brand name Narcan. This funding supports programs that serve people who are being released from jail or prison. It provides a resource to emergency medical service providers, our local shelters, and many other community-based organizations. I also want to highlight that we have established partnerships with our towns and with Medic and CMPD and many other agencies to increase access to naloxone across the community. We are also working on a process to streamline distribution and track data for naloxone resources. That is currently a gap that exists in our community and we're wanting to address that so we can really see the reach, the full reach of naloxone resources or Narcan resources and that we can then identify areas that may need additional support. 
So now I will give you a brief overview of the programs that we are funding with that $6 million that was available for community organizations to apply to receive funding. As background, the county received 78 applications as part of this funding process from 64 community agencies. The total funding requested for in total from these applications was more than $37 million. We had just over $6 million available to be allocated. So we could only support a limited number of proposals, but I am very appreciative to all of the agencies that applied and to all of the meaningful work being done across the community. In total, we selected 16 programs that will receive funding, and I will briefly describe the nature of work that will be done in each of the funding strategies that we selected. First, with early intervention funding, we identified Thompson Child and Family Focused, Project 658, and Children's Home Society to receive funding. Our goal is to ensure that these agencies um, offer programs, services, or trainings to encourage early identification and intervention for children and adolescents, as well as their parents and caregivers, and specifically those children and families who are most at risk for problematic substance use. Agencies funded will connect ch to children and families in their homes, in, their, in schools, and throughout the community, and will provide a diverse array of services that include one-on-one -on -one counseling, all the way to opioid education curriculums offered in the schools. In addition, several of the providers in this strategy will offer training to professionals and individuals across our county to ensure that they are prepared to work with people who are experiencing opioid use disorder. For evidence-based addiction treatment, we are funding Charlotte Community Health Clinic and Amity Medical Group. These are health clinics that provide services aligned with the American Society of Addiction Medicines National Practice Guidelines for Opioid Use Disorder. Specifically, they take a harm reduction approach using medication-assisted treatment. As many of you are aware, harm reduction is a public health approach that recognizes the complexity of addiction and seeks to empower those who are impacted by substance use. As the name suggests, harm reduction models are meant to lessen harms that accompany drug use, even if a person's goal is not to seek complete abstinence. The gold standard of treatment for opioid use disorder is medication-assisted treatment, which I referenced earlier, commonly known as MAT, and this upholds harm reduction principles. In MAT, I'll go a little deeper here, it's um, the use of medication, often in combination with counseling and other behavioral health therapies that can help reduce the symptoms of withdrawal and sustains recovery for people who have dealt with opioid use disorder. The programs funded within this strategy will provide MAT services to uninsured and underinsured populations. And again, in, in, similar to the work we're doing with Alliance, will help to expand the available of M availability of MAT throughout our community, which is a great need. For the employment-related services strategy, we are funding Charlotte Area Fund, National Center on Institutions and Alternatives, and Hope Haven. These programs offer employment support, such as job training, job skill development, and job placement services to people in various stages of treatment or recovery. These programs will help individuals obtain meaningful employment and other work-related necessities, whether that be transportation, job-related requirements, or certifications. These workforce development programs, along with those wraparound supports, will ensure clients have the skills and resources they need to secure and sustain employment. For recovery housing support, our goal is to increase housing resources for people who are struggling with addiction or for people who are in treatment or various stages of recovery. And for this strategy, we are funding Queen City Harm Reduction, Hope Homes Recovery Services, Oxford House, and McLeod Center for Wellbeing. These agencies provide a range of housing that includes residential treatment, transitional housing, and independent living. In addition, it will allow agencies to support clients in paying move-in deposits, which helps to, and also help to prevent evictions. These types of supports will ensure that clients do not have to choose between paying for treatment and paying their essential bills. Through many of these programs, individuals will also have access to peer support specialists and other individuals with lived experience. 
And lastly, regarding the community-based applications, we funded four agencies for recovery support services. And this includes Smart Recovery, Carolina's Care Partnership, Amity Medical Group, and Hope Haven. For this strategy, we're investing in peer support specialists or care navigators within programs to support others who could benefit from their lived experience. Agencies funded through this strategy will recruit, hire, and train peer support specialists to help individuals on their recovery journey. And through these services, clients will be connected to essential resources like behavioral health treatment, medical care, housing, and employment. Funding will also create additional support groups for people in recovery throughout the community. Now, something I want to highlight before closing my section of today's presentation is um, that along with our opioid settlement efforts, we have additional behavioral health uh, strategic planning that's going on right now that I want to make this group aware of. In November of 2022, we embarked on this behavioral health strategic planning process. And in the past year, we have brought together a steering committee that consists of 30 key stakeholders from the community from a variety of fields that support people at all types of different behavioral health needs. And we have also held 20 community and provider engagement sessions with more than 400 participants total attending those events. Through these sessions, we have learned that many of the things about the behavioral health system in our community are challenged. We've heard that it's fragmented, frustrating, and difficult to navigate. And as you can see from what we are investing in with the opioid settlement funds, those are the issues that we're wanting to address. Now, I'll briefly describe the identified key priorities from our behavioral health strategic planning effort. And I call these out because these all very much align and connect to the North Carolina Memorandum of Agreement and the strategies we're funding with our opioid settlement funds. All of this really has to come together because this crisis around opioids is part of a bigger system and bigger issues related to behavioral health. With collaborative and coordinated care, we are seeking to create a comprehensive and accountable network of agencies working together to ensure seamless transitions from clients. Because as you can imagine, if someone gets uh, a, a bad referral to an agency, they're going to lose progress in their treatment. We also recognize the need for social determinants of health investments and supports. And these refer to those non-medical factors that affect a person's recovery, such as housing, employment, and transportation, to give just a few examples. We want to be sure that clients know how to navigate these complex systems and access resources related to the social determinants of health. Prevention and early intervention is meant to reduce stigma around behavioral health issues and increase supports, programs, and services to individuals who have the greatest risk factors for behavioral health needs. And with access to care, we want to be sure that people can access quality care in a timely manner as close to their homes as possible. Lastly, we are also looking at service array as a key component to our behavioral health planning efforts because we know there needs to be a consist an available array of services for different providers and treatment modalities in our community. Everything from emergency services to uh, short-term outpatient services to inpatient to long-term uh, supports. And all of these investments and, and priorities uh, relate back to our opioid spending plan, whether it's early intervention, evidence-based addiction treatment, employment, housing support, or recovery support services. And I highlight this again just to encourage you to understand that these are all of the efforts the county is working on right now and encourage you to get involved. We plan to have a draft of the Behavioral Health Strategic Plan ready in spring of 24 and uh, to present that to our board. We will also publish it for a 30-day comment period. So I appreciate your engagement here today. Uh, presenting the progress we have made shows me that you know, we have made strides in the last year, though we know we still have such a long way to go. Um, it's critical to remember that everyone in this room has a role to play, and you're really doing that just by being here today. So uh, thank you again, and I will now turn it back over to Megan Palmer, who is going to walk us through a table exercise around priorities for responding to the opioid epidemic. Go, Megan. Thanks, Robert. I mean, what a thorough and meaningful uh, presentation of all of the progress that's been made this past year. So we really appreciate that research and, and data that went into that. And I'm sure that next year there's going to be even more, so stay tuned. 
Um, now we're going to do a table exercise to get your ideas and feedbacks on priorities. And um, there's going to be two steps to this, or two categories that we want each table to brainstorm and discuss. So first of all, I want you to look at your table and see if you have this worksheet. It's very simple. It might be in color, and there might be a black and white. Everyone has at least one, right? OK. So for this exercise, um, we're going to break out into table groups and have 15, 20 minutes of discussion. And we want someone to record your thoughts and ideas on this sheet, which I will we'll explain how that works in just a minute. Um, at the end of the table talk, depending on time, we'll call on a few tables who will ask to give a very brief synopsis of the ideas their table came up with. And we're going to ask that you limit it to two or three minutes um, so that we can hear from more tables as time allows. If we heard from every table, we'd have to call in a free lunch. So, um, so you may want to, as you discuss, you're going to need a note taker. And then you might want to go ahead and identify your uh, table's spokesperson. Okay. And again, we want to manage expectations. Uh, there's some giggling up there. Y'all all pointing to each other? Okay. I always say if you can't find a spokesperson, you count to three and you point to someone at your table and someone will organically come out as a spokesperson. Works every time. Um, again, we want to manage your expectations and, um, and that while all your input is very valuable, uh, you're coming from different aspects of the community with different experiences. Also want to shout out to the youth who are here today um, who, who are very creative and have some great ideas. Um, we want you to understand that there's a lot that goes into the decision making. And so there may be policies or laws or rules that have to be followed. So we will hear from you. We will hear from you. Some ideas will be accepted and acted on. Some might have to be tabled. We've got 18 years to get through this process. Um, so I just want to make sure that you, you understand that. All right. Who's familiar with uh, Stephen Covey and the time matrix? Anybody? A few people. All right. So we're taking two aspects of this four quadrant time matrix, which I'm a trainer and I'd be happy to train you on the matrix, but this is not the time. Um, it's, it's a tool that gathers the interest and priorities about urgent activities and important activities. So the urgent activities are those things that require immediate attention. Um, there's a deadline, meetings, uh, pressing issues, introductions, um, making connections. And so to give you a couple of examples on this, let's say that you have an overflowing toilet in your house. Oh, that, that would be an urgent problem, and I would go and turn off the water and call a plumber as soon as possible. Okay? What if, on the other hand, we look at important activities, and those are the ones that represent your values, mission, and high priority goals. So let's say that I'm concerned about my heating or electrical bill. Um, so I decide to research high, effic high efficiency windows and solar panels. So it's not something I'm going to act and just automatically get these panels <clears throat> in other tools, but I'm going to do my research, do some um, price comparison, and all of that. That is an important activity. And that requires goal setting, creative thinking, planning, relationship building, learning and renewal. So what we're asking you to do is, again, it there's no right or wrong answers. Be as creative as you can, progressive thinking. What are some urgent things that either you can do um, within the next month, six months, year, urgent, um, or a community group or another group can take on? And then also, what are some important things that you feel need to be looked, on, looked upon as a long-term solution? Um, so I just came up uh, with this example if we're looking at the opioid, opioid crisis. An urgent activity that maybe all of you want to do is to have a family discussion about the concerns and dangers of opioid use. 
That can be done tomorrow. That can be done over the Thanksgiving meal. Um, if we're looking at an important activity that requires a little bit more forethought and planning, perhaps establishing outreach programs for schools, neighborhoods, communities as an awareness campaign. That could be important. So hopefully that gives you a little clarity of what we're asking you to do. So at your tables, we're gonna ask you to uh, consider our community's opioid situation, share your suggestions for urgent and or important activities, and please record it on that worksheet. Do we have any questions? Y'all are smart. I know you can do this. Um, I'm gonna be circling around to help um, if there's any questions. Sometimes it gets fuzzy about urgent versus important. You know what? Just get it on there. That's all we ask. We're gonna pick up these sheets at the end and compile all the suggestions and, um, and somehow that'll be shared out, okay? All right, so get to it. If you haven't introduced yourself to your table mates, now's the time. And I'm going to start off with 15 minutes.
getting ready to come and get that. Huh? Two. Okay, then I'll take care of it. But you're killing my feet. Giving you a time check, we've got about four or five minutes left. Okay, everyone, my guess is you, can, you could continue talking about this, coming up with ideas for like 30 minutes, um, but we do have an awesome keynote speaker coming up next. But before we do that, we want to hear from a few of you, a few of your tables. And again, if you, your spokes model just wants to stand up and read the list, that is fine. Um, we are going to take these sheets up just to let you know. So if we don't call on your table, we certainly want to include that in our report. So with that, do we have a table who is willing to share their brainstorming? I'm going to start back here. You actually get a microphone. And if you don't mind standing up so people can see you, that would be awesome. I wouldn't have volunteered if I had to do the mic, if I knew the mic was coming. Um, I'm Christine Cesaro, I'm the president of McLeod Center, so this was fun. Everything is urgent, of course, so I'm, we tried to be fair about um, where we place things. But, um, and some of this we're already starting, right? So Narcan needs to be everywhere. Barbershops, vending machines, in hospital lobbies, 
hospitals, emergency rooms, giving it out. Um, gas stations. I know personally of kids that have just died in the parking lot of gas stations. Um, hard and fast statistics about drug trafficking in our community. I don't think that information is out there enough. We're fortunate enough to have board members that are on vice, and so we hear it a lot. But if, as a mother, I think that if I heard it, I would be much more aware and having those conversations more readily with my kids. Um, wraparound services for children of who have parents who have substance use disorder. So these kids for sure um, were, are gonna have behavioral health issues, probably also have substance use disorder issues. So if we can wrap specialized services around them now, I think that we'll be doing ourselves a favor. Um, important category, um, we think it's important to develop addiction fellowships and to support that financially in this area. A very smart, smart person recently told us that doctors who train usually stay within a 30 mile radius of where they trained. And so the more physicians that we can recruit with that specialty, the better off we're all gonna be. Um, improved funding model, my CFO was sure to pull a point out. <laughs> Um, especially for those smaller agencies, it, it is a very, very, very thin margin, and so it's difficult for us to be sustainable with the current funding model. Um, building partnerships within each other in our organizations, we need to do a better job at that. We don't have to do it all alone. We can partner together, and it's better for our patients. Um, figure out how to communicate awareness in the community. We talked about who are the influencers in our community that can speak about this to their audiences um, to help get word out about that, what we're dealing with. Um, and then getting more big corporations involved and engaged in this work that we're doing. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Looks like we have a youth to hear from. Yeah. Or I'm really misreading your age. <laughs> You have the height of a grown-up. Uh, so I've been told. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Because as a member of the youth, it, I was talking about this at our table, it really does choke me up and makes me happy to see how many people here actually care. Because sometimes in, in life, it feels like no one really does care. Um, um, I heard you mouth Narcan in schools. We do have that on our list. I think Narcan in schools is very important. Um, and for urgent, we have education, um, like addiction programs in schools and adding it to them. Um, I think that instead of, at my school, if you're caught vaping in the restroom, you are automatically expelled. I go to a private school, or I think it's expelled, don't quote me on that. But I go to a very small school with uh, 67 high schoolers and uh, 200 total students. And I'm even seeing this in my school. Um, one of my friends goes to AK with 4,000 plus students, and she's even seeing it in her, in her school. So it's happening everywhere. Um, and better uh, rehabilitation programs, most definitely. Um, I think that if I were to go to my school or the guidance counselor and say, hey, I have an addiction to vaping, or I have an addiction to marijuana, or just needing that support, what's gonna happen is I'm most likely gonna get in trouble with my school. That's not okay. If I have the strength to come to you and say that I have an addiction and I need help, I don't wanna be penalized for something that I can't control. Uh, at my school, we have this thing called Open Parachute. It's basically where we get together and talk about like how to treat others, how to be a better person. And over the time that we have spoken, addiction has been brought up because we are still young, our minds are developing. So with our minds still developing, it's a lot easier for us to get addiction, ad addicted to something because it's still, our minds are still developing and they're growing. So if I'm here vaping every single day, I'm gonna start thinking that that's normal. And then when I get older, it's gonna be even harder for me to quit. Um, what's, I'm sorry, I forget. Christina, and she mentioned something of a keystone. Am I saying that right? It's, it's a uh, peer support program, uh, which is specialists, and it's for every age? Would you like the microphone? Sure. 
Um, I just think that was one really cool model. And guys, I'm Christina from Hope Homes Recovery. Um, they, Keystone and Rock Hill, they put drug support specialists, one in each high school um, around York County. And it is really cool to see the difference of instead of automatically getting suspended or ISS, um, you have the option to speak to a drug support um, or an addiction support counselor. And then you have a grace period. So instead of that automatic one, you get to go to that specialist, you get to make a plan. Um, the family is involved because I think family services are just as important as the student. Um, but it's just a cool model. So we were talking about models like that versus getting in trouble right away. And yeah, I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day and come here and actually, actually caring. And it just makes me happy to see everyone here discussing ways that we can help change our community and bring, well, starting with Charlotte, just bringing and making it better with drugs and substance abuse. So thank you very much. Definitely a future leader of Charlotte. Okay, we have a time for maybe two more. And I, I see these two first. And unfortunately, again, it, it, we, if we had more time, we want to hear from everyone. But if you'll just go through your list quickly, that would be awesome. Um, my name is Justin Irby. Um, I'm an addict and alcoholic of five years of continuous sobriety. Um, I'm a stepfather also to a seven, uh, little girl that at seven years old, she found her daddy dead in the bathroom with a fentanyl needle in his arm. So I think I got a dog in the fight. Um, our, uh, our urgent needs are exposure to the young children, um, using them on a level of recognition like a food allergy. You know, telling them that, hey, if you get stung by a bee, you're going to have to get stuck by this EpiPen. You know, if, if you use this white powdery substance or take a pill from a friend, you know, same thing. You might die. Um, I am very open with both of my children. They, they know, you know, about this. this and um, uh, we believe in the Narcan distribution. Like a lot of people have said, this is an effective um, means. Um, I also run a uh, recovery housing network called WibWib. And we had to use two doses of Narcan on a 25-year-old girl about two weeks ago and saved her life. So uh, this does work. Um, the uh, in-depth, you know, is allowing people to go to these treatment facilities without having insurance. Um, you know, I'm a product of the Charlotte Rescue Mission Program um, four and a half years ago. Um, the 12-step programs, um, having access to transportation to get to these meetings. Um, you know, the, the, the Fellowship of AA has been around for 88 years and has saved millions and millions of lives. Um, and housing, um, you know, there's, I've seen there's nothing more frustrating than to get out of a treatment facility and not have a place to live. And you get the, what we call the efforts and just go back out and drink or use again. And then you die. So thanks. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. Somebody, where was, all right. Uh, again, last one, but this has brought up something that I'm hoping you'll take advantage of when we conclude today. We've heard of several services that are here. Um, we encourage you to stay behind, ask questions, and network so that you can learn more about the resources out in the community. You know, we, we would love to have more time to have that discussion. Maybe that's something for next year. Who knows? Okay. Okay. I, yeah, okay. Um, I'm Beth. I'm um, program manager at Queen City Harm Reduction, um, which is housed under the Center for Prevention Services. Um, so our, <laughs> you're welcome. our list is um, uh, basically, so under urgent, under urgent needs to triage polysubstance use, um, it is not exclusive, exclusively opioid use that is a huge contributor to overdose death and to, um, you know, the, the issues that we're having, but, you know, treating kind of all of the substances involved in that, um, in that fight. Um, offering peer support and social support slash safety nets. Um, just having more social support in general, family and friends support, um, you know, having people um, in the lives of people who use drugs who are treating them and talking about them as if they are people um, with humanity and with the potential to, you know, improve their lives even if um, they're still, you know, kind of dealing with substance use. I feel like that is something that um, 
you know, everyone could, um, you know, always improve upon, I, I'm myself included. Um, anyone receiving MIUD should be able to continue while incarcerated. Um, so folks that are receiving um, methadone or suboxone, um, you're not, um, you're not typically able to continue when you enter the Mecklenburg County Jail. Um, so continuing uh, MIUD and um, avoiding uh, withdrawal and sickness and um, at different points it's contributed to death, um, but also continuing health insurance upon release. Um, reducing punitive approaches in general for relapse and recovery housing. Um, the one and done, you've relapsed and you are out of a house is coercive and it's harmful to people who use drugs. It, it creates a lot of instability um, and a lot of um, inconsistent uh, resources for people who desperately need consistency in their resources. Um, so on the under important, um, we want to use youth prevention to work with youth and avoid requiring triage of drug use later on. Um, better communication between families and providers, so a lot more honesty, a lot more direct communication and conversation. Um, more focus on physiological needs um, rather than exclusively substance use. So addressing some of those social determinants of health that are contributing to drug use are just as important as addressing the substance use. Um, having more difficult conversations with parents, that's difficult today, but being able to have those honest and frank conversations about what could occur and what, you know, what the future holds for opioid use in the community um, is always a worthwhile endeavor and it could prevent some youth substance use. Um, also more research into adult trauma and how ACEs um, impact adults and become an adult problem um, that's based on you know, events in their youth and also how adult trauma impacts um, adults that are engaging in substance use. Thank you. You should all be very proud of yourself because I know that there's another 100 great out, um, ideas out there. We're gonna capture them. What I'm gonna ask you to do, whoever took the notes, put master on the top so we make sure we grab the right one because other people are taking notes on uh, the other one, okay? Okay. It is with great pleasure and a profound sense of purpose that we gather here today to embark on a crucial dialogue a dialogue that could shape the fabric of our community and the lives within it for generations to come. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Nicole Augustine, a luminary in strategic growth and an unwavering advocate for health equity. Today she is here to share with us not just her professional insights, but also her personal commitment to turning the tide on the opioid crisis through strategic prevention and the critical role of harm reduction. As Nicole leads us, through, uh, leads us in this discussion, let us open our minds to the transformative possibilities that her experience and guidance have the power to unlock. So with that, All right, let's make sure my clicker is working here. One second, how's everybody doing? Good. Good, oh, I like that, some response. So, <laughs> good morning, everyone. I am excited and honored to be here before you today for more than one reason. The gravity of the topic that we're discussing today, I really appreciated the young man's uh, conversation, what he shared earlier, it just really touched my heart but also just to really recognize this moment in time as being huge for more than one reason. I don't know if anybody else picked up their calculator, but I picked up the calculator and I added my age to 18. She said the teenagers, the youth in the room will be in their 30s. I was like, wow, I'll be 59, okay? Just to really think about the time and space that we're in, this opportunity to really change our landscape and to focus on prevention specifically. So I'm here before you today, not standing as an expert, and sure I have credentials for that particular perspective, but really I'm standing here as a fellow Mecklenburg County resident whose personal life has been touched by this topic 
and who is also extremely excited for the fact that we have a potential of 18 years of funding to do something radical for our future. Right? Yes, that's like, that's something to be really, really excited about. So I will say this, uh, as this beautiful uh, picture here, I often think about how for a long time, for me and I imagine for many others, I only thought of the opioid crisis as something that impacted white communities. I never really saw myself in the conversation. And this gap for me closed significantly in 2019. Uh, I am someone who has lived experience indirectly. I ended up being raised by my grandmother because neither one of my parents were able to take care of me because of their own issues with addiction. So this topic touches my life just in general. But it wasn't until uh, 2019 I was taking care of my grandmother, had a home health care nurse who was helping out our family, and she shared with me that she overnight became a single parent. She lost the father of her child to an opioid overdose on a work trip. And I couldn't even imagine receiving the phone call. He left town to go to Connecticut for a work trip. And what is profound to me about the story is the folks they were working with, they thought he was just drunk and hungover from the night before. And they're like, oh, he'll sleep it off. They went to work, but when they came back to the hotel that night, he was unresponsive. And he'd actually overdosed uh, on an opioid. And when she was sharing this story, I had this moment of so many thoughts. One, it was our first time for her to even know the work that I did. Okay. And then I really started thinking about what could have been in place, prevention, early intervention, to really help this family not have experienced the level of disruption that they now have. You know? So these are some of the things I think about. I just really understand that we are in a profound place of change. And I'm excited to share with you all the things that I have learned in prevention. My background comes from the space of prevention. I'm actually looking here at Zarana in the room. When I first came to North Carolina, <laughs> this is where I learned all of my prevention uh, at Anuvia. It's just a, a wonderful thing to kind of think about even transition over time. So what I want us to think about is what can we learn from prevention? What do we need to know about substance use? The, um, and really, I also want to think about what you all know. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with a platform called Mentimeter, but I'm gonna ask everyone to grab their cell phones if you don't already have it out, and actually just open up the camera on your phone, and what I'll show you here is a QR code, okay? Uh, very quick and easy, you should be able to get right in. It's going to put you into my presentation. Uh, you'll only have to do this one time. Uh, I'll have a couple questions that you'll answer and then we'll all be able to see them. But it'll let you follow along too with the slides. So wonderful. I am seeing some folks who are tapping that they're in, so wonderful. Hopefully everyone got in okay. If you're having trouble with your camera, just open up a browser if you have a smartphone, type in minty.com and just put in that code. That's another way you can do it too. Fabulous, okay, I'm seeing a lot of people get in. So here's the first question. I am curious, how would you rate your understanding of opioid prevention and early intervention strategies? I wanna first get a sense of where we are in the room. Great, seeing some folks put in their votes here. Okay, what our knowledge looks like here in the room. Okay, wonderful, thank you all. Okay, okay, so we have some knowledge in the room which I would expect just hearing some of the introductions of who's here. Uh, but there are also some folks who are saying, you know, there's something I can still learn. So, fabulous, okay. All right, so what have we learned about the opioid crisis? And interestingly, the group who shared over here harm reduction, um, Queen City harm reduction, actually, this is the very first point that I wanted to make, is an understanding of the concept of polysubstance use and to recognize that the opioid crisis is not just about opioids. 
This is a really, really important thing for us to understand and consider. And that research shows, and they mentioned it themselves too, that there's the high probability that if someone is using an opioid, that they're also using something else. The one thing that I can say about prevention, and this is why I personally love prevention so much, is prevention itself is grounded in understanding human behavior, human learning, how substances impact the brain and the body. And as a result of that, the tool of prevention is, I believe, universally applicable. And that when we focus our space in prevention, not only do we impact the opioid crisis, but we create this domino impact on other substances, whether that's alcohol, whether that's cannabis, right? All these other things become positively impacted by the strategies we use to address opioids. So I think it's important that we understand that prevention is based in science. This is something that sometimes we uh, may not know and understand, and it's really anchored in understanding the brain and how the brain works and how, how we process. So what I want to share with you all are just what I would say two key things that we have learned in prevention that I think should guide our strategies moving forward. The first one has to deal with age. We have enough science to know, and some of you have said it in the room today, that the age of first use of any substance is what creates further risk. The younger and earlier someone begins to dabble and experiment, the greater the likelihood and possibility of them developing an addiction later in life. This is why we focus on the youth so much when we're talking about prevention strategies. The other thing to think about, too, is that um, in addition to early use, I think it's also important to understand the progression of use. Um, sometimes this is, there's this narrative around the progress into addiction. And so I want to share this graphic here that I think really attempts to illustrate levels of use before you get to the place of a substance use disorder. And this is really kind of like the golden nugget of prevention is what I, what I would call it. The early stages of substance use include no or low, low risk and risky use before you even get to the place of what's considered addiction, which is that blue box at the top. And so often we miss opportunities to intervene early or to prevent altogether because what typically happens? We wait until people cross into the blue box before they're even considered for care, right? To access treatment to access resources. And unfortunately, the reality is, the uh, longer we delay prevention and early intervention, it creates other challenges as it relates to treatment in general. So this is a really important thing to think about and consider. Um, I'm happy to see that in the strategies that have been talked about and mentioned, sure, we're doing some work that's focused in the blue box, right? Dealing with treatment, improving access. But this is truly our opportunity to also consider what are the, if you notice, the two levels below are pretty big, you all which means that's wonderful, great opportunity. So I'm always thinking, okay, over the next 18 years, what exactly can we be doing to really get in early to reduce harm over time? And I'm gonna share some of those strategies too. So what I wanna know, we'll do another Mentimeter here. I'm just showing this code in case anybody lost it that quickly. Hopefully you didn't. You should be able to pull your phone back up and it's, it should be there. It shouldn't have gone anywhere in those few minutes, but just in case it happens sometimes. So what I'm curious about, I just showed you all the pyramid. Think about for a moment yourself. Do you know someone who you believe uses in a no or low risk fashion? Do you know someone who uses in a risky way? And do you know someone who you believe might have a substance use disorder? I wanna just get a pulse on the room. I know earlier when we asked for hands rate, everybody said that they at least know someone who has been impacted by opioids. So I'll be curious here what this looks like for us. Okay. Okay, so not surprising, most of us know someone at potentially any of these levels. And what my question often is, is despite knowledge, whether it's personally from family or friends, 
there is still this shroudness of silence around the conversation. And I think it's important, we wouldn't be able to leave this day without having a conversation about stigma, okay? Because stigma truly, truly impacts so many things. Um, it impacts people getting access to care. It impacts people feeling safe to even ask for help, right? It impacts when it's not you wondering, can I even have a conversation with a family member that I'm concerned about? So we've got to begin to address stigma. And what I want to do to really um, anchor this for you is to compare it to another condition, one in which I think many of you are familiar with, and that's diabetes. So what I want you to imagine is someone being diagnosed with diabetes and how different the experience is. As they embark, embark upon care, their prescribed medication to regulate their insulin, they may gradually change their diet or their lifestyle. And throughout the process, not once do we as society look at those folks as weak, as morally flawed, for needing medical help or attention. Not once. And if anything, the relationship with the healthcare system is looked at as a long-term commitment to improving one's health. And that's very common of what happens when someone is um, diagnosed with diabetes. I'm sure some of you may know family members or friends who have diabetes and their blood, their blood levels are not criminalized. <laughs> They're not used to judge them or their worth, right? But the very, very different experience happens when someone is uh, diagnosed with a substance use disorder. So I want to take just a moment to create this parallel here uh, to provide uh, the different story of what happens when someone understands that they have a substance use disorder. Often this realization uh, happens from a traumatic event uh, potentially even entangling them with the criminal justice system. And the response is worlds away from someone discovering they're diabetic. They're met with shame, with blame, with judgment. Their tests, whether it's urine screens, are used to uh, criminalize them, right, to judge them. It's a completely different process altogether. And uh, I found a really wonderful spoken word example from a first person experience of what it's like to experience stigma when you have a substance use disorder. And so I have requested a read of this while we're here today. And uh, we'll ask that uh, Donna Marie do a reading for us. Words, words have impacted me at my most vulnerable times. Some words felt like attacks, attempting to replace my true identity. Instead of intelligent, funny, or hardworking, I became homeless, indigent, and incapacitated. The words become grenades, strategically spoken at times in order to do the most damage. And when those words came from family and friends, they cut even deeper. These labels erased my humanity. Total strangers felt allowed to criticize or judge me, saying that I was such a waste of life, useless, or just a drug addict. These words also carried the connotation that I was lazy, selfish, or a criminal. After a while, I began to believe these words, concluding that I no longer served a purpose, had opportunities, or deserved hope. Luckily for me, eventually these feelings were replaced with optimism, encouragement, and words that provided healing. Spoken words cannot be unsaid. And they have the power to build up a person or to destroy a person. When we choose to be compassionate, we become a part of the solution, giving an opportunity to others to be successful. This reading was from Marissa Angerer of Texas, a mother, friend, lawyer, person in recovery, and a shatterproof ambassador. Thank you for that. 
I mentioned stigma in words because I think it's important as we leave today and go out that we're extremely conscious about the words and language we use because it creates an environment that keeps people away from help. Uh, again, let's do one more Mentimeter here. I'm curious around how many folks feel as though stigma is a challenge um, in their community. There's three options here for how you can vote and we'll see uh, what folks are saying, experiencing. Do you believe stigma is a problem? Okay, votes are coming in. Definitely it's getting in the way. Oh, I actually love that there's some folks who are saying not for us. So maybe we have some really progressive folks in the room. And my hope is that as we move things forward for the communities that are figuring out how to address stigma, that we also do some resource sharing on what that is. So definitely it's getting in the way. Most folks have voted for that. Stigma truly is one of the biggest challenges I think we really do have to overcome as we move forward into prioritizing this work. I think stigma is the main reason why we don't focus our work on prevention. Think about it. Prevention means you have to acknowledge that a problem could exist, might exist, you can do something about it before you see it, right? Uh, we have to really remove the lens of stigma to help us create those priorities. So let's talk a little bit about the science of prevention. I thought I'd first begin with just sharing some of the strategies that don't typically work only because in my uh, tenure of doing prevention, these are some of the strategies that come up very often. Um, prevention, unfortunately, we're a young field. Many of us remember prevention of the 80s and 90s. How many people remember D.A.R.E.? Anybody remember this is your brain, crack, your brain on drugs, right? Yeah. The cracked egg, okay? I'm not sure how that helped people not do drugs. But these are reefer madness, anybody remember that? Okay, so we have a lot of examples historically in the population of what prevention is. Unfortunately, a lot of the examples of what people go to and think about are not necessarily the tools and resources that really will help uh, reduce the likelihood of risk. So there's three of these I just want to mention specifically. The first is one-time events. And as much as one-time events in communities feel good, they're great to organize, they rarely have a lasting impact. And this is a really important thing to think about when we talk about prevention. I'll talk about the strategies that do work. But it's important, if you can only do one, I say, let's not just do one. Right? One event. I mean, how life-changing is one event? Not very. The other thing that I think it's important to recognize is there is research that looks at personal stories from people in recovery, specifically to youth and young adults. And the reason that this particular strategy has shown not necessarily to work as well is because at this stage in life, the young man said it earlier, the brain is still developing. So unfortunately, one of the things that does happen is that when a person in that age, developmental age, looks at someone to see that story, a couple things happen. Well, first of all, that's not gonna happen to me. Okay, right? There's this feeling of indestructibility, and I appreciate your story, but that won't happen to me. I know what I'm doing, okay? The other type of response we see too is when the person is in recovery and successful sharing their story, the other thing you see in that young teenage brain is you seem to have come okay. You've worked out. You're successful now. So help me understand how your experience in addiction, come on, right? Because I'm looking at you in recovery and successful. So what ends up happening is sometimes these are the strategies we look for. We like, let me find someone in recovery and talk to the youth about not doing drugs. And as much as it's a wonderful way of thinking, because of the brain development of a teenager, it doesn't really sink in in the same way that we think it would for that audience. The last one that I'll point out and mention here is mock car crashes. Now, this particular strategy, folks know about this. This is the one where there's some sort of sensationalized depiction of substance use disorders. Uh, usually there's a one-time event circled around it, right? Talking about the consequences of substance use. 
The biggest challenge with this is the same thing as the previous one. That won't happen to me. I know, I'm a professional. I know how to do things, right? So sometimes, again, these type of strategies, as much as they're uh, sensationalized, unfortunately don't really create the change that we want to see happening. So what does, right? I want to share a, a few strategies. These strategies are actually adapted from SAMHSA. So SAMHSA has a prevention office that offers six prevention strategies that are, I say, really designed to provide a comprehensive approach. What I encourage you all to think about is I'm going to show you what the six are. This is not about cherry picking one and doing it. Ideally, you should have three or four of these strategies happening at any one point in time. Okay. So the first one is providing information. Uh, most, I think a lot, I heard earlier today, people talking about needing more information, increasing awareness. This is a foundational strategy in prevention. How do we share information, whether it's about the, you know, what's happening, reducing stigma, right, improving awareness of, of the context and situation. Uh, this is characterized by what we call one-way communication. So you don't want to do this strategy alone for sure. Remember I said one-time sessions don't work? Well, what does work is multiple sessions. So just because one-time sessions don't work, we're not saying to don't do any of that. We're saying prevention is a science where we've built curriculums, education, information that usually happen over multiple sessions. And one of the, I think, the most common misnomers about what prevention is, it's not really about teaching the drugs and what they are. It's about uh, sharing life skills, okay? Because if you really think about it, when does that happen in life and society? When do we learn life skills? We don't really. Prevention is a space because it's based on human behavior and learning where you can literally place a curriculum right inside of a school system, you know, places like that, to really help our young people know and understand uh, what prevention is. The third strategy is what we call alternative activities. And this particular strategy attempts to get to the fact that if you think about it, a lot of our social environments are centered around substance use, any sort of celebrations, any sort of gatherings. And so how do we create community spaces that allow people to gather without the focus being on the substance? Okay, so alternative activities is a way to kind of think about that. How do we give our young people things to do? A lot of folks say youth are bored. That becomes the reason. So how do we keep people from being bored? And I always say we focus on youth being bored, but I'm a grown up and I get bored too, <laughs> you know? And so I think about how, how often can we even enter into a space where the focus and intention isn't on consuming the substance. The fourth strategy is around how do we mobilize communities? And first, how do we recognize that communities should be at the center of one, understanding what the need is, what's going on, but also being the architect of their solutions. It's really important that we don't come with a, the expert from on high to show a community what to do right, that we really lean to communities to understand what's happening, to be advocates for their own change, and that that is a part of the mobilization that occurs. The fifth strategy is actually connected to the fourth. And this one is thinking about, uh, we heard the term earlier, social determinants of health, which simply means to truly think about all the auxiliary things you have in your life, air conditioning, housing, if you needed a dentist, you can find that, right? If you needed to change your tire, you wanted to go to a library, you wanted to breathe fresh air in a park or drink fresh water. These are all things that truly impact our health. And for some communities who are experiencing inequity, this particular strategy really attempts to address that. Uh, and so a part of this is looking at taking a true analysis of the environment and looking for opportunities for policy change that will improve the health outcomes of a particular community. And then the last strategy is called, I call it screening and referral. And what this is recognizing, everybody remember my, my, the, peri, the pyramid, okay? So the reality is in prevention, we don't address substance use disorders. But I have my professional cousins 
in behavioral health, right? So a part of the work that prevention does is how do we screen folks to assess early whether or not they're in the risky category? Because think about it, that is the best opportunity to change the outcome versus when someone already gets to the top in the blue. It's so much harder to do the work there. It's not impossible. We have people in recovery who have done it every day, but this conversation is about prevention. So the last strategy is focused on the skills around screening and then linking people to the right place to get additional care. So these are what we call, in the professional world, we call them the CSAP-6, okay? You won't write that one down. That's a SAMHSA word. <laughs> But I just call it strategies that work, okay? Strategies that work. And ideally, the idea here, don't just cherry pick one. Really think about how can you use a combination of three or four of these happening at any one period of time. So a couple things I want to share. This, this resource, I want to share some resources here. This resource was mentioned earlier, the North Carolina uh, Memorandum of Agreement, or we call it the NCMOA has a wonderful website called More Powerful. It provides all, all, all the tools and resources uh, that you'll need locally, including what was mentioned earlier, Exhibit A and B, that has all the list of potential uh, treatment, early intervention options. So I encourage people to check that out. The other resource everyone should know, and this one's on your tables, is the Opioid Response Network. Anybody heard of the Opioid Response Network? Okay, so a couple people, wonderful, yay, yay, yay. Uh, this is your taxpayer dollars at work on the federal side, okay? And what that means is you can put in a request, you see where it says T submit a request, you can put in a request for help and support for the work that you're doing in your communities. Whether you need help with training, whether you need help doing strategic planning, you'll be connected with a consultant who can actually assist you in doing and realizing the change that you want to have happen. Potentially even helping you with a strategy that you chose from exhibit A and B. Uh, and it's of no cost, okay? No cost to you. So in wrapping up, I wanna take a minute just to review what we've, what we've talked about and shared. Uh, one, the recognition that prevention is a viable strategy for changing the outcome, not just for opioids, not just for opioids, but the domino impact on so many other substances that are impacting our community. We um, have learned that the sooner we catch a problem, the better, right? And that um, we have an opportunity to really uh, create change around stigma specifically. So as we head out of here, I'm going to ask that everyone take something from today to share with a family member, with a friend, with a coworker who wasn't here, that everyone make a commitment to sharing at least one thing from today with somebody. I want to thank you all for being here, for caring, for choosing to be here today, and um, giving your commitment to what I believe is such an important, pivotal moment. So I leave you with a quote. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change, not just the world, we're talking about our county, truly. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So thank you all for your time today. Oh, thank you so much, Nicole, such valuable information and insight and hope. And I don't know about you, but it seems like that the results of the, the um, feedback groups that I did and then the table work that you did, she somehow captured all of that in an organized manner <laughs> and on top of it gave us recommendations. And so that was just awesome. Um, I'm going to call Dina back up for some closing remarks. I want to remind you that at your table, there is a poll that we ask you to complete um, before you leave. You want me to go? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so let me just first thank everybody for being here. I want to thank Nicole for her awesome keynote speech. That was really incredible. Um, so let's give her another round of applause because she was fantastic. 
Um, I also want to recognize uh, Bobby Williams, who's the assistant town manager of Huntersville. I want to thank him for being here. I believe our sheriff, Sheriff McFadden, was here for a short time. We want to thank him for being here, as well as Lieutenant Sprague from Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. We want to thank uh, them for being here this morning to share in this uh, terrific event. And, uh, and I want to say your, audience, um, your attendance tells me that we are all committed to ensuring that these funds have the greatest impact possible for Mecklenburg County. Many, if not all of you here today, have been impacted by the opioid epidemic, whether it is through the clients you work with, a family member's experience, some are from school or perhaps even your own journey. People that we lose to this epidemic are often in the prime of their lives and they are cut short on their capacity to live and contribute to our community. The settlement represents a unique opportunity for us to invest in best practices to lead us through the crisis and stop the loss of life and human potential. It is essential that these funds are guided by the latest research of what works to prevent and treat addiction as well as the voice of those affected by the pandemic. Or, see, I still have pandemic in my head. Epidemic. I think it'll be infused in there forever. Um, we need to infuse our community with meaningful resources such as early intervention services to help youth and families, syringe services programs, and robust access to Narcan and medication-assisted treatment. We also need to address the social determinants of health that influence people's likelihood to engage in substance use and their ability to have optimal recovery resources such as housing, employment opportunities, and support services that allow for re-engaging in the life in a purposeful way. As a county, based on your input and feedback, these are the investments we are making with our settlement funding. However, our community will need more than this funding to turn the tide of this epidemic. I call on each of us here today to do what we can to help individuals, children, families, receive the support they need to prevent and reduce the harm of opioid use. There are simple but important ways you can make a difference. First, learn more about the opioid epidemic and how it continues to affect everyone in our community. This will help reduce the stigma and increase compassion for people who are struggling with addiction. Second, get involved in the county's ongoing work related to our behavioral health strategic plan, which will, once, once complete will be used to inform our efforts and investments. Visit MECNC.gov for the latest updates. And lastly, we have a limited number of Narcan kits available here today. If you or someone you love could benefit from having this resource, please take one on your way out. As we approach the end of today's program, I would like for you to take a brief survey at your table using the printed QR code. Please be as candid as possible as your feedback will help us make the necessary improvements for future engagements. Thank you again for your commitment and attendance today. This work for all of us has been a journey, and I look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you so much.